Hello and welcome to Key Characters. My name is Hal Crawford. Today, I'm speaking with Frank Cheng. Frank is the co-founder of God Game Aperon, and he's a bit of a loose guy, as you'll see. I really enjoyed this interview. I hope you do too. My name is Frank Cheng. Uh, I'm the Lord Keeper and co-founder of uh, Aperon, Lonely Megas. And uh, well, my, my role here, uh, we don't use the C-suite roles. So, so Lord Keeper is more a fun role that we try to keep a lean management on. And, uh, but uh, my role in the company, so I, more the guy who, who founded uh, everything and uh, funded everything in the beginning, and I spitball high concepts. I, um, and then I, I mostly find people who are as crazy as me to, to either fund uh, the project or work uh, on the project. And I also run the Discord community. But you also have to make hard decisions, like if you have to sack someone or something like that, you'd have to make that decision, wouldn't you? Well, we have, we have, we have two other co-founders for Aperon. Uh, one is Orange uh, and the other is Jem. Jem is more the CTO and Orange is the COO. He's the one who sacks most of the people. I sack some people from the community, but, um, well, uh, Orange is really, uh, more the bare brain of the operations, uh, in terms of, uh, getting my high concepts onto the ground because I, my background isn't from game development. I, I'm a management consultant and a uh, private equity investor back in the days. You, you, I can tell you're quite humble as well because, um, and, and that, that's not something you often get in a, in a leader of an organization. Um, but so, so you put up, you put up the money, uh, you had the idea and the studio is called Funi Magus. Is that how you say it? Uh, Funi Magus. Yes. Yeah. And what does that mean? Lunamikas is actually a, a really, really um, a random name we came up with. Tony is actually my son's nickname, and my son was born around that time, and everyone pretty much liked him. Like, uh, sometimes he comes to the office crawling around. And um, so so we call it Funi, and then uh, I think Funi is this doll, one word, so I call Megas the other word. Uh, Megas is actually my favorite character from my favorite childhood game, uh, Chrono Trigger. Uh, it's a Super Nintendo RPG, one of the best JRPGs out there. Uh, and Magus is one of the more badass characters you can recruit in there. And so I combined the two to put in Magus. Right. Really yeah. Oh, I'm glad we, I'm glad we got to the bottom of that because I've, I've been doing research on you guys and I've never been able to, it almost sounds like a Scottish name or a Celtic name <laughs> or something. Tun is my, my son's nickname. Why don't we start with what is Aperon? Aperon, well. Apron is, to put it in a very simple term, it's, it's a god game, a game that literally lets you play god. And, um, yeah. <laughs> well, I've been a game all my life and I've been a very professional gamer. Well, I'm not a very professional, but I play very competitively, uh, before I started working. So I was in, um, I was, I was one of the top 50 players in Star Wars 1, vanilla. And I've always been interested in games, but after working, I don't really have much time to play games. I still buy games. I was given the opportunity, met the right people to, to start my own company. And I was thinking, what should I do? And gaming is the first thing I could think of. So I think going for innovation is, is a must. And that's how we, how I really came up with the, the, the revive the God game genre. I play a lot of games and, and, um, God games is actually one of the ones I replay quite a lot. So I talked to a lot of different developers and, and, uh, and then I, I found uh, a few crazy individuals. Uh, one of them was orange to, to start this idea. With. Um, and then it really grew, uh, to, to what you see today. What we are trying to do is here is trying to in, uh, find a sustainable model for the developers. What you see around the space is the, the gig development business is very prevalent in the entertainment industry, where teams converge and disperse based on gigs, uh, one-off uh, events. It's it's okay, uh, but I think for for Hong Kong and for our team, I think it's more important that we develop a uh, a product, a franchise that 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 can be more sustainable. And so we didn't just develop Aperon from a game perspective. We developed it from an IP, sort of like the Japanese ACG perspective, where we have animation, comics, games, stories, and merchandise in mind. And um, and so we have a bunch of toys, uh, plushies, because mm. and we have story elements, uh, animation that's going to come 
uh, to couple with with this this game, which is not just a single game. One uh, thing one thing I've noticed uh, in this world is that there is no shortage of ambition for people who are making blockchain games, and <laughs> there are lots of, there are lots of organize anyone everyone I speak to is like, oh no, I'm not just making one game; I'm making several games. Now, there's there's a tension there, isn't there? Because that what you say is right. You know, there's franchise building, which is smart, and you know you get. Um, synergy with all these other cross-media opportunities and multiple games continuity but on the other hand you have to ship games as well right mm -hmm. so how do you like and you can be too ambitious well, it's a very most developers actually don't have uh, the funding or the resources to develop for seven years but to be honest a lot of our money was made playing actually as well um, <laughs> yeah, hang on you made you made funding money for for Fooney and, and, and the other company through playing Axie? Yes, uh, because we were, we were always exploring um, different gameplay business models and everything, and blockchain came along. Actually, uh, our co-founder, Orish, um, he, he pushed for AppPro to become a blockchain game really early, like in 2018. But, but it was too, and to us, it was, it was, it was, uh, I was too skeptical back then, so it didn't really, uh, uh, not too much in there, but then he pushed really hard again, uh, early in 2020. And then, so we began looking at different games and everything. And so we began playing a lot of Axie towards the end of 2020, um, towards the end of 2021, mm. uh, we into a lot of games and then, and then, uh, we found it to be quite interesting. I think we owned 2% of all Axies back then. Wow. And then, uh, and then we, we looked into that game design. We, they, because they are not creating new cards. Uh, new, new axes. So we, we studied them and then we pretty much found out how they were balancing. So, so we just kept breeding axes according to the next meta update. And then we had a huge farm going on and, and, and we witnessed the rise of, of axes. And now that obviously suffered a fate. I mean, they're back now. They're making their game Homeland. You know, that looks promising, but. You don't want Aperon to suffer the same fate that Axie did, right? A bubble. Well, we, we tried to remodel our system and our tokenomics and how our NFTs work to make sure that we don't suffer the same fate. But, um, well, what we really tried to do is make the system a bit more flexible. We definitely found a, a mechanism that can allow us to be more adaptable by using more, I believe, more assets tokens, mm -hmm. uh, which sounds counterintuitive to most investors, but actually by having more tokens and more resources and assets, it's, it allows us to filter different types of users and, and, and allows us to, to devise more mechanisms to engage different types of user behavior. So that's a complicated system. So I've, I've read what I can about your tokenomics. Um, and I always read white papers and they invariably confuse me. Um, <laughs> and. <laughs> And I always wonder how, who, who gets this? Do you have to understand Aperon's tokenomics to play the game? Oh, I'd say not really. To play the game, definitely not. Because for most user journeys in the game, I mean, it's everything starts from the tutorial. You get the basics, you get the basic coin, the token. As you progress, as you level up, you, have to, you get to learn more. And uh, how do we? turn the blockchain functions and processes as part of the game because the best tutorials, the best games, I've always envisioned they, they actually don't have tutorials because the tutorial level has been seen incorporated into the narrative, into the storytelling. And we want to uh, do something like that for the on-chain side. So um, I certainly hope there'll be breakthrough in on-chain technology and functions in the future and stuff. Now, what about wallet sign-in? You know, I've, I speak to many um, developers who like hide hide blockchain integrations. They set up a wallet in the background, and then when the players are ready, they give them access to it. Maybe yeah. we're exploring that heavily right now too. Actually, are you? Yeah. Uh, Aperon, uh, our demo was out. It's sort of like our beta. Uh, the season one was out, um, and season two is coming. Season one, we gated it behind like wallets, registration, and even NFTs. Uh, but it was an MVP there. Uh, we got great feedback and traction over there. But coming out in season two, the more complete PVE rope-like cycle will be there. And that's where we plan to onboard more players. 
And so we need to explore the non-custodian wallets parts of the equation or the custodian wallet parts of the equation. Mm, the, mm. the guest login, that's why we'll work with uh, certain platforms or even build our own custodian wallets where we hold the wallets for them and try to onboard the user. Um, yeah. And that is definitely a must for most Rapri games right now. I think um, the, honestly, the population of Rapri gamers right now is really, really low. Probably in the five digits, like 10 to 15k organic users. Uh, a lot of the others are just bots and old grinders are uh, trying to, to capitalize on the system. Yeah. Because there's act, there's active hostility from a lot of Web2 or a lot of mainstream gamers. There's, they hate the word NFT. They hate the word crypto. <laughs> uh, well, most, most gamers back in the days hate mobile. Another thing I've noticed is that people have trouble shipping product mm. um, and hitting, hitting sh deadlines. So oh, you, what, what's your roadmap look like, Frank? You've got Season 2 coming up, and that's going to be, as you've said, um, less insidery and more open so easier to get into yeah um, season two we are we've been working with some of the launches so you've got hyperplay the one that's being developed by the uh, metamask um mm -hmm. the x metamask team uh epic games recently opened up their self-publishing model so we applied hopefully something good comes out but got some esports teams uh that we work closely with and they will be uh announcing their their well well their partnerships and hopefully we'll get more more of their players playing and giving us feedback. Yeah. Feedback is actually a very important in terms of the battle. Part. So Frank, tell me how many people do you need to be playing your game to actually for this to be for this to work? I know you're a numbers guy, so I know you would have a number. So well, uh, to in order for the ecosystem to be sustainable, I think a good ten thousand active players is a must. Uh, but to really go on to become uh, more of a success, I mean, then we really had to hit the, the basic metrics of uh, what a successful mobile game. So, um, well, I wouldn't call it successful. I call it sustainable first. Success is 10 million. I buy an enemy. And then <laughs> I, I just a mere 10 million people. 10 million would be the, well, well what I call success, like, well, that, that would be the, the definition of success. But, but for us, I mean, 10 million will be a great milestone. I think 10, 10 million, uh, uh, purchased users. So right. because it's an NFT game and the players who have interacted or who bought a planet somewhere along the journey will be called, uh, uh, a paid user, so to speak. And then we'll probably also be onboarding some of the more, uh, experienced marketers in the, in the space. Uh, to help us get the messaging in a more simplified and, and um, direct manner. As you see throughout this meeting, I'm actually not great at that. I easily digress and always talk too much instead of focusing on concise points. That's a running problem I think I'm running into. Yeah, yeah. well, the, the great thing about you is that you're very open. So I, I'll take any measure of digression as long as you uh, tell me interesting things. Tell me, Frank, about your personal journey. So... You, I know that you started in um, a management consultancy and, and in the world of finance. Um, how different is, is Frank Cheng now from the Frank Cheng then? You know, I've seen pictures of you with a suit and tie, Whoa. and I'm not, I'm not seeing you wear a suit and tie these days. My personal journey, well, I, I have a pretty typical like Chinese Asian guy. So uh, our parents have great aspirations. And as, a, as an opportunist, so to speak, most. Asians or Chinese people are. Well, uh, they, they, we, we look at what's, what's best out there. What's the best job? What's the, uh, what's the current trends? What's the most prestigious job that, that can get you a good resume? My mentor told me to look into private equity and, and, uh, then venture capital. It was insane. The amount of people I met, uh, the stuff I learned. Um, but also, um, I, I was always a game. So even, even between the drinking and work, I'm always trying to take a look at what's out there in the games and try to play. Single player games mostly. I always wondered what it would be like to start my own things. And I was given the opportunity and, uh, a little crazy because I uh, have to sacrifice a lot, stable income, great connections, great lives and going from buy side into sell side. That's, that's a very big transition. But, um, I really wanted to try and it was, it was very tiring, very demanding, uh, absolute flip of roles, but extremely rewarding. It's a strange, it's a strange world, isn't it? Because you make something 
uh, in isolation, not quite isolation, but you make something for years, years and years, and then it's out there and it's either going to work or it's not going to work. Does that make you nervous? Yeah, it does. But well, the, the, the times are better. I mean, gaming, they, they, you are not launching a single product anymore. It's always, there's always patches that development you can adjust and tweak. And the communities are more open, channels more open. And a lot of uh, community members, they, they're willing to stay as long as they see potential. Wonderful. Did you, uh, did you have more children aside from Fooney? Yes, I, I also have, uh, I have uh, another, uh, I have one son and one daughter. My daughter is one year old and uh, she's Kelly. And uh, her nickname is Som Som, so may have something along the path like that if we have a subsidiary. Uh, Frank, I really appreciate you um, being so open and having this talk with me today. Well, hopefully next time we talk, we can talk more about the actual game and the gameplay and how to get more there. Maybe we should have a chat um, when I've played uh, Season 2. Play Season 2. It's a lot more approachable. Right? It's a lot easier yeah. to play. Season 1, yeah, we made yeah. it pretty much on a Dark Soul uh, uh, like uh, difficulty. And uh, it was, it, it's very sadistic. Season 2, it's a lot more approachable. Yeah, great. And, and good luck, Frank. Thank you. We'll need it. So that was Frank Cheng from Aperon. Good on you, Frank. Please like and subscribe and I'll see you next time.